time now for another fun installment of Fireside Chats about your pet's health. Here once again is Dr. Brian Langlois of the Pet Pantry of Lancaster County. Hello again everybody, this is uh, Dr. Brian Langwa, board member of the Pennsylvania Veterinary Foundation and welcome to the third installment of our Fireside Chat Series. As you can see, we're in a slightly different location today at the uh, Fish Place, that pet place in Lancaster County on Centerville Road. We have a nice new fire uh, fireplace set up here. Uh, we're still working on live fire, but at least we've got a fake fire going now. And um, along with the fire, we notice that things, at least in this area um, of the country, are finally, finally starting to warm up just a little bit from the incredibly cold winter we've had. And uh, anytime we warm up, we start thinking about spring. The, the one thing we also start thinking about a lot of is kind of fleas, ticks, all those little creepy crawly things that uh, can infect your dog and cat, and uh, some of the problems they cause, as well as some of the best ways to prevent them. And this, this is one of those topics and one of those situations where really, Prevention is the key to all of this. There are so many things, and we'll go through some of them, that fleas and ticks can cause that we get worried about. However, just doing simple monthly prevention, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, is something that certainly can help um, alleviate any of those concerns and make things a lot better for your pet. So let's talk first just a little bit about fleas and ticks in general and, and, and kind of the differences between the two. A lot of people definitely can tell by looking the difference between a flea and a tick. Um, but their life cycles are, are very much different, and uh, the way that they infect it is very much different, too. Probably the biggest difference between fleas and ticks, and one of the biggest misconceptions that's actually kind of out there in regards to fleas and ticks, is that fleas, everybody knows, can jump, and they can actually jump quite high. Uh, you know, anybody who's seen a flea jump, you know, compared to their body size, they're actually one of the most efficient jumpers of anything out there, both up and lateral or horizontal and across. Ticks, on the other hand, cannot jump, and that's actually one of the biggest misconceptions about ticks. The ticks do not jump off something and then onto you or onto your dog. Um, the way ticks kind of infect is basically uh, when they go through their final molting stages to the adult where they will attach onto an animal, uh, what will happen is that they will just kind of climb up onto tall shrubs or grass or something, kind of stick their you know, top little feet out and just try to grab onto anything that brushes by. So that's where, you know, your dogs, and even you, when they recommend you going out and, you know, with your dogs in the check yourself and kind of wrap up your pants, do things like that to prevent ticks from getting onto your body. So those are kind of the, the main two differences between the two. And obviously they, they can affect the animal in different ways. What we're gonna do now is just quickly uh, go through a couple of uh, slides just kind of showing you the life cycle of the flea and the life cycle of the tick so that you guys can just understand a little bit about how these different medications that we talk about later and preventatives work as well as trying to um, make sure you understand what areas we're trying to target when we treat these pests. So we'll take a look at that real quick and then we'll be back and talk about some of the problems that uh, you know these, these uh, insect vermin can cause on your pet. So here we see kind of just the a brief diagram of the life cycle of the flea. So you can see how the flea will lay eggs that will hatch into larvae that get down into the carpet, feed on the debris. They kind of molt and grow and then pupate almost like a butterfly. Uh, and then the adults emerge at the right time and then will go on to infect another animal. As we kind of move on now and look a little bit at the tick life cycle, you can see there's multiple stages to the life cycle and they can have multiple hosts, which are a little bit different than the flea and are the reason that they can actually pick up diseases and transmit diseases to other animals. You can see in this uh, diagram here how there's actually three or four separate hosts as they go through their various life cycles. So that's a little bit of a difference that you see right there. All right, so I hope that kind of gave everybody just a general understanding of the life cycle of the two uh, the main parasites that we deal with, fleas and ticks, and uh, why, obviously, knowing their different life cycles explains why the treatments that we prescribe for them as well as the preventatives will work like they do. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So now the next question that comes up in everybody's mind, well, why should I worry about fleas and ticks? Sure, they may bite me every now and then. You know, I may see them, but what, what's the real concern to my animal? And fleas and ticks can present a number of concerns to your animals, and, and we'll show some pictures of some of the conditions that they can cause a little bit later. The big thing with fleas that we worry about is a condition called flea allergy dermatitis. And basically, this is a big fancy word for saying that the bite of the flea causes this really bad skin reaction in your animal, dog or cat. And they present a little bit differently in dogs and cats, and again, we'll show some pictures of the differences in a little bit. What happens in flea allergy dermatitis is the animal actually reacts to the saliva of the flea. 
And when the flea jumps on an animal, bites it, the saliva has these allergens or these components in them that cause this really, really, you know, bad itching type reaction in your animal. The skin gets very red, it gets very inflamed, uh, you know, and the animal just gets driven crazy by it. It's incredibly itchy. And what will happen is that dog um, or cat will start biting or scratching at the area where that inflammation is. That biting and scratching causes more inflammation, which causes more itching. And then you get this kind of downward spiral effect where more itching leads to more biting and scratching, which leads to more itching and, and so on and so forth. And eventually what happens is you get the skin so irritated and, and kind of so inflamed that you allow secondary bacterial infections to kind of sneak in there. Bacteria that's on the skin normally doesn't cause any problems. Um, can get under the skin a little bit from these scratches and bite marks and uh, causes just a very localized skin infection. If it's left for a long period of time without getting treated, you actually get to the point where there's these pustules that form on the skin, there's a lot of hair loss involved with it, uh, the skin become, can become very thickened. In dogs, normally we see these starting to show up right around the tail sections, kind of like at the tail base, the hind end, areas like that. Cats, since cats don't read the book on anything, pretty much can have um, these and uh, inflammation areas anywhere throughout their body. A classic tip off with cats is they get what we call a miliary dermatitis. And again, that's just a very fancy term for saying that they get these kind of little skin bumps all over them uh, themselves. They sound like little, they feel like little millet seeds. And that's where these kind of, um, where the term came from. So what we usually have to do at this point is treat the animal with some steroids just to reduce the, the scratching and some antibiotics to clear up any secondary infection. So it's really important that we try to prevent this from happening just to prevent the suffering and the, and the uncomfortableness that your animal may feel when they go through these sorts of things. On the tick side of things, the big thing obviously we worry about is um, diseases that can be transmitted from one animal to another by a tick. And the big one that everybody hears about and everybody knows about is Lyme disease. And this is a bacterial infection that's basically spread after a tick bites an infected animal, takes up some of this bacteria into its gut system, falls off, and then bites another animal. And this is why when we went through the life cycles of the tick, it's important to realize that obviously a tick can have multiple meal hosts, whereas usually a flea will spend its entire life cycle on one animal, a tick will go from animal to animal as it goes through its various life cycles. And so this is why Lyme disease and some others, such as Ehrlichia and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, again, a lot of it depends on what area of the country you're in, um, can be spread uh, from animal to animal or animal to human, uh, things like that. Now, the important thing to remember about Lyme disease in animals is that we normally don't see that classic bullseye rash. That's usually the telltale sign in people. They see a tick, they see this kind of bullseye rash. In animals, you don't see it for a couple of reasons. And the first one is, uh, one, obviously with fur on, it's very, very difficult to see. And two, sometimes we just think they don't get it. Um, they don't show it. So we miss kind of that early window a lot of times. And especially with the, the main tick that transmitted, it's deer ticks, they can be so small, it's very, very hard sometimes to see them on an animal um, to be able to even know that your animal was, was potentially uh, bitten by a tick. The main things that we usually see with Lyme disease in dogs is arthritis type signs or lameness, limping. They seem painful in their joints. And usually it can shift from one leg to the other. And that's kind of like a tip off sign that we often see. So, you know, if you notice all of a sudden your dog, who certainly seems to be fine, starts limping on starts limping on another leg, just seems generally off, maybe a little ouchy. Lyme disease is certainly something that you want to, you know, potentially consider. And you want to, you know, get your dog to the vet just to have a quick blood test done. It's something uh, to let you know, you and your vet know if Lyme disease is there. If it is there, it's usually very easily treated uh, with a course of antibiotics. Um, I will say usually the antibiotics go for about a month and usually some anti-inflammatories, again, just to reduce that joint inflammation. In rare cases, if it's missed, you can see other concerns such as heart issues, kidney issues, things like that. We don't see those too often in animals. Normally it's the arthritis signs that we see first. We treat it, we know about it. Um, if you have a dog that tends to go out into areas, you know, wooded areas, goes with you on hikes, things like that, it really is a good idea that along with heartworm prevention, and we're, we're going to talk about heartworm in a future video, um, that you also get your animal tested yearly for Lyme disease. And again, it's, it's a very simple blood test. The two tests, the heartworm and the Lyme, are now combined into one easy test they call a SNAP test. Uh, you get the results in about 10 to 15 minutes, uh, and it kind of gives you, you know, a, a good way to go. 
as far as treating Lyme disease in your dog. There's probably like two or three different ways you can go. Some people will do a month of antibiotics in the fall and the spring, and what that will do is basically allow uh, any bacteria that's kind of dysmer residual, because it is a little hard to totally clear this infection um, to keep everything in check and not cause any problems. The uh, other treatments out there potentially are sometimes we do some treatment with antibiotics and then we will do some blood work to see if you know, the, the levels of the bacteria are low enough that it's really not going to affect your animal. What's interesting about cats is cats seem to just not get Lyme disease. Uh, we're not quite sure why, uh, but they just seem immune to it. And uh, you know, so you really don't have to worry about it too much in cats. Could it in theory happen? Yes. Um, but cats seem to be very, very resistant to it in the way that they are kind of a little bit more resistant to heartworm infection too. But again, we'll, we'll talk about that in a future video. The important other thing about Lyme disease and a lot of these tick uh, transmitted diseases is that the tick has to attach for a good 48 to 72 hours before they actually, and um, as upsetting as it sounds, kind of regurgitate the, the bacteria into your animal as it's feeding, taking a blood meal. So that's again why a lot of these preventatives are so important of either preventing attachment or killing the tick before it has a chance to attach for a long period of time. And that prevents any transmission of disease. The other big concern we have, just shifting back to fleas for a little bit, is um, tapeworm infection. And tapeworms, everybody has seen them, kind of the gross pictures, either on YouTube or, you know. Uh, ticks, or fleas, excuse me, do transmit tapeworm. And the big issue, obviously, with tapeworm is it can lead to a lot of problems such as uh, lack of weight gain, um, gastrointestinal issues, uh, things of that nature. And so the way that an animal is infected with uh, tapeworms via fleas is not through the bite of the flea itself. That's very important to know. It's when the animal feels the flea bite, it starts to groom and actually just ingest the flea, and that's how the tapeworm eggs get into the animal. So, you know, it's important to remember that anytime you may notice a flea infestation on your animal, you want to talk to your vet about potentially getting the animal treated for tapeworm. Don't treat them both at the same time. You're just going to kind of go back and forth. Treat the tre fleas, treat the tapeworm, treat the fleas, treat the tapeworm, and you're never really going to get everything completely under control. So what we're going to do now is just take a quick second to look at some of the uh, classic presentations of flea allergy dermatitis, a little bit about Lyme disease as well as um, tapeworm infection. Uh, we'll just show you what some of these things look like so you have a better idea of what you're dealing with. And when we come back, we'll talk about the final kind of stage, which is prevention of these um, parasites from infecting your animal and kind of the differences in the products that are out there. So we'll take a look at that real quick and we'll be right back. So here we see kind of just the typical presentation of a flea allergy in a cat. Uh, you can see how the entire cat appears to be infected. The skin looks very angry and inflamed. So this is the cat that obviously has been going through stuff for quite some time. And then we just kind of move over to the dog. This is more of the kind of like the typical presentation we see in the dog. You can see uh, just the hind end area, very itchy, scabby, hairless, uh, things of that nature. And, um, you know, th this is the typical sign of a flea allergy that we notice in dogs. This is just a quick picture showing a little electron micrograph for those that are more science -inclined. Line. This is what a Lyme disease organism looks like, the actual spirochete bacteria that causes Lyme disease. Um, you know, as you can see, it's uh, quite a cute little bug. And then finally, we're just going to show a quick thing. On occasion, if you're lucky enough, you actually can see the bullseye rash, and this is a bullseye rash being seen in a dog uh, that was bitten by a tick that was infected with Lyme disease. So on occasion, you do see it. All right, so we've kind of, you know, now looked through basically what fleas and ticks are about, some of the problems that they can cause, and hopefully you've gotten a better idea through some of the pictures that we've shown um, exactly what kind of things we worry about. So the final thing we're going to talk about is probably what everybody really wants to know, and that is kind of how to prevent them, how to treat them, uh, things of that nature. So the first question that always comes to mind is, well, how do I know if there's fleas or ticks on my animal um, if I'm not seeing any of those classic kind of signs of flea allergy dermatitis? The easiest way is to use something like this. This is just a very generalized flea comb, and you can kind of just go through, brush through your animal's fur, and uh, just kind of pull some of the hair that comes off. And you'll, you're, what you're looking for is either live fleas, which is great because that gives you your answer right there, live ticks, things like that. But sometimes if you're not quite sure, you're also looking for something called flea dirt. And flea dirt are these little blackish specks that you will find all through the coat. Um, and some people mistake them for a little bit of just maybe mud or dirt or dander, things like that. And there's a very easy way you can tell if it's actually flea dirt versus just kind of dirt, dirt in general. And flea dirt, as kind of disgusting as it sounds, basically is flea excrement. And flea excrement basically is dried blood, if you think about it. They're taking in a blood meal, so they're going to poop it out the other end. 
And uh, basically the easiest way to kind of de to determine what you're dealing with is if you just take a little bit of that dirt, put it on kind of like a white paper towel or something like that, and moisten it very, very gently. If it is flea dirt, you'll see it take on a very reddish hue like blood. That'll kind of give you your answer as far as um, if you are dealing with flea dirt uh, as far as that goes. And then you can go about kind of treating uh, the animal accordingly. Now, when, as we go on to the, the ideas of treatment and prevention, there's a couple of things that are very, very important. And the first of which, and I cannot stress this enough because we see this all the time, is there are products out there to treat fleas and ticks on dogs. There is a product in, or there is a chemical in those products called pyrethrin. And that is a product that is designed solely for dogs. It cannot be used on cats. It will cause a very horrific muscle spasm type reaction in cats that sometimes uh, proves fatal, that we cannot pull them out of. And it can be a very involved treatment at your vet. It involves hospitalization, IV medications to kind of calm down the muscle contractions, things like that. We will show you a quick video as soon as I'm done with this of what that reaction kind of looks like in your cat so you're aware of it. Um, but the best way to do it is to always look on the packaging. Do not use any flea or tick product that is solely for dogs on cats. I cannot stress that enough. And I actually do feel it's a, it's a fault of some of the manufacturers of these products. Do not put these warning labels on big enough so that people do not see them well. Um, but please do not do that. Use something that is only designed for cats just for cats. So that, you know, if you take absolutely nothing else away from this entire fireside chat, please take that away. Do, do not put dog products on your cat because they are not the same thing. So when we start looking at kind of treatment options out there, there's two main things, and, and this is another misconception I think that people have. There are what we call like the flea, flea shampoos, such as this here, um, that have products in them to kill fleas and ticks. Now, these types of products are what we call knockdown products. Um, basically, uh, what that means is that they will take care of the, the fleas and ticks that are on the animal at that time, but they have no residual activity, which means they don't stick around once you rinse your dog off and, and bathe them and dry and stuff like that. So what will happen a lot of times is people will put this on or flea powders, things like that, thinking that'll take care of the problem, and it won't. Uh, you know, it'll take care of the immediate issue of the, uh, the fleas and ticks that are on your animal. But as soon as that all dries off, any fleas and ticks that are in the environment will say, hey, okay, we're going to jump right back on and, and start causing the problem again. So this is a good product to use if you have a really severe infestation on your animal just to get fleas and ticks off the animal. But it's not going to have any as what we call residual activity. So that's important to remember. The next thing that a lot of we really recommend in the veterinary profession are any of what we call the spot-on products. And this is Advantage. This is an example of one of them. Um, Advantage is another product that you can only get from your veterinarian. It's called Activil, which is also a very good product that has just come on the market. All of these pretty much work the same way. Uh, what they do do is they kind of, you place it just right on the back uh, of the animal, right onto the skin. It's a little uh, small amount of liquid. That liquid then spreads throughout what we call the sebaceous layer or the fat layer of the skin. It does not go systemic in most of these products. Um, and what will happen then is it just kind of stays residual in the oils and the skin of the animal for about three to four weeks. Uh, some last a little bit longer than others and some it depends on how heavy your flea burden is. What then happens is as soon as a flea or tick jumps on, jumps on the animal, they get, you know, they um, come in contact with this because it's already through the skin and then they're killed uh, rather quickly. A lot of these products will have flea kill times anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. Uh, some will do it a little bit quicker. It kind of depends on the product. But the nice thing about these also is a lot of these now come with what we call um, insect growth regulators. And basically what this means is a big fancy way of saying that as we looked at the life cycle of the flea, um, specifically, you notice that there were egg stages, larval stages, you know, they fall off the animal, get into the carpet, things like that. Well, products that are on the skin are kind of shedded off as the animal normally sheds its skin. Those flakes of skin fall down into the carpet where these larvae may be. They ingest this and basically die. They're not, they're not able to move on to the next stage of development. So we attack all stages of uh, the life cycle of the flea using these, these topical understand the difference between a residual product, such like a Frontline, and Advantage, Activil, things of that nature, and a knockdown product, such as a powder or a shampoo. Um, that's very important because there's a huge misconception there. The next question that comes up is, well, then where do flea collars fall in all of this? And I will give my personal opinion here. I am not a fan of flea collars. 
uh, for a couple of reasons. I don't feel they work very well. Um, if you notice, the flea collar usually concentrates a lot of the chemicals and medications up by the neck area. Fleas are not idiots. They, you know, much as they're very, very small creatures, they're just going to go away from where the chemicals are and then congregate on the other side of the animal where the concentration of those medications is gonna, not, not going to be nearly as high as they would be up by the neck. So you want to be careful as, as far as that stuff goes. The other thing that I have seen with these uh, collars is if they're not sized properly, we do see some issues that develop as far as um, the animal getting it stuck in their mouths, which can cause really horrible mouth uh, irritations and ulcerations. I just recently dealt with a cat that actually had it somehow hooked up under its arm and it caused a really, really bad kind of cutting in wound into the entire armpit area. Fortunately, that animal, that cat is doing great. Um, you know, she'll actually be up for adoption very soon through the pet pantry of Lancaster County. And, um, but just try to avoid the flea collars. They, they, they really just don't work, um, you know, as well as we would like. There is one type of flea and tick collar out there, and it's called Scalabor. It's something you can only get from your veterinarian. Um, and that is one, since the chemicals in it are different and the mechanism of action in it is different as far as how it spreads through the body, um, is something that I do think actually works very well. So you can talk to your vet to see if they have these Scalabor coll collars. They can go on your uh, dog. They last for about six months, which is really, really nice. Um, and they actually do do a kind of just my little soapbox issue as far as flea collars go and, and things like that. So the final thing we're going to talk about, obviously you've treated the pet now. The, big, the other concern, what a lot of people forget about, is treating your environment. And you have to treat them both simultaneously. Or again, you're going to have that effect of take the fleas off the animal. As soon as that wears off, the fleas in the environment are just going to jump right back on or ticks jump right back on, things like that. So, you know, be aware of that. And there's, there's tons, probably hundreds of products out there that can treat the home environment. And you really want to do your research on this. Talk to your veterinarian before trying one of these products because you want to make sure that it is safe not only for your animals but for anybody else in the house. Um, we usually recommend using certain things. There are flea carpet powders that you can use that you can kind of put on the um, carpet uh, and then vacuum up. The biggest thing we usually recommend with uh, environmental control is just really being anal about cleaning. Um, you know, it's constant vacuuming, and if you're vacuuming with bags, you have to throw that bag out as soon as you're done vacuuming and make sure it gets out of the house uh, because these larvae, the fleas, all that stuff can actually get out through the bag eventually. Um, so you want to be careful with that. Uh, as far as using some of these other products, again, like flea bombs, um, you know, some of these other environmental sprays that you can put around, they do work. You just have to be very careful to read the instructions, make sure that you're using the right number of these products for the square footage that you're trying to treat, and make sure you read about the toxic concerns. Um, you know, these are poisons, if you think about it. You know, we are trying to kill something without killing the live animals. So you want to make sure you do talk to your veterinarian about all of these things to make sure that they do um, what they're supposed to do and not have toxic side effects, not only to your pets, but yourself, your children, um, especially if you have young toddlers around the house, things like that. You want to be careful with all of that stuff. So what we're going to do is pretty much uh, just show you a very, very quick video, as I said, about the concern we have with the, with the dog products going on cats. Um, and that's going to show just this type of really kind of uh, tremor type reaction that we see with these cats, because I want people to be aware of this. I want them to be able to see this. So here you can see a cat that actually has been treated with a dog flea prevention that has those chemicals in it that can be very toxic to cats. And you can actually see, um, as we look in a little bit closer on this cat, the, the intense tremoring that's going on. And this is actually after the cat has already had some of the product washed off of it. Um, as you can see, it's very, very severe. The cat really can't control any of its muscle movements. Uh, it would have difficulty eating, urinating, defecating, and this is why it's at the vet. Uh, this is a, an emergency situation. It does have to be treated as such. All right. So uh, again, I hope that helped to kind of show how serious uh, these reactions can be in these cats and how uh, basically hospitalization is needed, things like that. So if you take nothing away from this type of uh, talk, I, I want you to take away that, you know, make sure you read the product labels that you're working with for flea and tick prevention. Please do not put any dog flea and tick prevention products on your cats because uh, you can obviously see the, the severe reactions that can occur when this goes on. So that kind of brings this fireside chat to a close. Uh, I want to thank uh, the wonderful location here at uh, that 
Fish Place That Pet Place on Centerville Road in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Uh, you can visit them on the web at thatpetplace.com. Uh, they have basically products and animals and anything you could possibly think about, they have information on and products for here. So it's, it's a really great store and I thank them for allowing me to use their uh, fake fireplace for this uh, wonderful chat. Um, Again, my name is uh, Brian Langwa. I'm a veterinarian and a board member of the Pennsylvania Veterinary Foundation. Uh, please check us out at uh, pavetfoundation.org and uh, hope you've enjoyed it. And as I kind of say all the time, just make sure if you have any problems with your pet, make sure you take your pet to the vet and not, as we say, Dr. Google or the net. Uh, it's much better to go that way. So we'll see you next time when we'll have another fun fireside chat topic. To learn more about this and many other conditions with your pets, be sure to visit these fine websites. And remember, this video is for informational purposes only and cannot be used to diagnose or treat any condition in your individual animal. Only your veterinarian can do that. So remember, if you have any specific questions about your own animal, make sure to contact your vet or better yet, take it in for an exam.